the decarbonization, as they say at uh, at Ford, is job one. <laughs> Yeah, well, I hope so. I mean, and how likely with capitalism's track record do you think that we'll be able to do that with minimal institutional intervention? How about them Lakers? <laughs> Oh, right. Ladies and gentlemen, back today, we've got somebody I'm excited to talk with. We got Professor Jerry Davis, Professor of Business Administration at the University of Michigan. He has a new book, Taming Corporate Power in the 21st Century, which is pretty important look at capitalism, how it works and what we should expect from the free market. How are you doing today, my friend? I am doing fantastically well. May is beautiful in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I hope you all come and visit us. <laughs> are the flowers blooming yet? The flowers are blooming. It's great. It's green and beautiful out right now. So. Yeah, you might have the same climate zone as us. We're in Germany and it's, you know, it takes a while for summer, spring to get going. But when it does, it's very nice. Um, so tell us a little bit about this book. Look, you, you, you were inspired with your research to write about a corporation as a social and economic vehicle. Take us into the whole idea of, of, of the thing. Yeah, so I, I started looking at corporations this way because in graduate school in the 1980s, there was just this ton of hostile takeovers going on, and corporations were going through this major transition. And it wasn't obvious at the time what was happening, but in retrospect, it was clear that, that it was that shareholder prominence, shareholder primacy was really taking over as the way that corporations were run. They didn't exist for communities, for employees. For customers, they really existed to create shareholder value. And we take that for granted now, but it was not at the time that I started writing about these things. And it was really clear that corporations have been critical to the 20th century economy. And now we were seeing this major shift in what they did and why they did what they did. And so my hope was, how do we unpack that a bit and try to figure out what is what is going on with the corporation? Yeah. And so what did, what did you find as far as uh, the way it used to be and the way that it is now. What really changed? Yeah, it's this is going to sound a uh, cliche, but in a good way, I think that that a lot of it has to do not just with sort of neoliberal ideology or whatever, but a lot of it was enabled by technology. So one of the themes in uh, in the book is that technology has transformed both what corporations are and how they work. And so we really don't have the right map to make sense of these things anymore. Some of the basic categories that we take for granted, like uh, like you ask, uh, what can we do to curb the power of giant corporations? Sure. Yeah. But, but even the word giant turns out to be a really hard one to make sense of these days. Like, is Zoom a giant corporation? They have you know hundreds of millions of users every single day. They had a valuation of a hundred billion dollars. Everyone knows what Zoom is. We're using it right now. So is Zoom a giant corporation? Um, they only have about 7,000 employees in the world, and they rent server space from Amazon and Oracle. So in what sense are they giant? So in some sense, the, the terminology that we've traditionally used to talk about corporations and their power, it's kind of not working anymore. In the book that I say, it feels like we're trying to fix the carburetor on a Tesla. We're sort of using a toolkit and an ontology for making sense of these things. It just doesn't work anymore. So the anti-monopolists, I think their heart is in the right place that we want to sort of take down powerful corporations, but they've got this map that doesn't really apply. And what I wanted to do in the book was to identify what are the real sources of power now. It can't just be being big because we don't really know what big is. Um, the, the different ways of measuring corporate size sort of don't correlate anymore. Yeah. It was also really clear that the biggest threats were among tech firms. It's not GE, it's not even Goldman Sachs anymore. It really is tech companies because they provide the basic infrastructure for pretty much everything else that happens in the economy. I mean, during the pandemic, uh, I was living in Menlo Park, California, we literally did not leave the house without checking on our phone what the air quality index was. You know, people were ordering their food online, they were uh, groceries online, they were going to work online. It was almost like the only way we could interact with the world was through these screens. And that really puts a lot of power in the hands of those who control the screens. Um, they've got this basic infrastructure, and that gives them a, a kind of power that 
you don't really see with other kinds of businesses. Now, these these companies, like you said, you said all these these big behemoths of, of the last, you know, century, Exxon, everything down from GE, you even said Wool's, Woolworth, I don't know. <laughs> I know who that is, but it's, you know, um, it's dated, but... You must uh, be older than you look, because right, right. anybody remembers Woolworth. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you love old music and old film, then you are automatically know everything about the past, but uh, yeah. But well, the difference in the way that these operate, because obviously there's these tech companies that don't have any assets, but still control a vast amount of data and have all this power and, and, and income, but like Uber doesn't have any taxis, but yet is the biggest taxi provider. So how have, how have they differed in this new century? Yeah, I think you've zeroed in on, on the right thing. And the, the analogy that I would use here is that corporate power used to be used to come from being the biggest skyscraper on the skyline you know having the tallest building that was a source of power now it's really being at the right intersection and that's something very different like if if you if you're looking for location 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 rather than height you have to use a different set of tools to get at this and um so some of the things that have come up since you're in the EU now when the EU thinks about corporate power, they look at gatekeepers, which is who are those entities that stand in between, say, buyers and sellers, where they can't really be replaced, where they're the ones that stand between, where you can't get from one to the other without going between um, these sort of choke points, as as uh, Corey Doctorow, your future interviewee, <laughs> uh, uh, describes them. And so that's a really different flavor of power than just being big. It's not just a brute force and size. It's really standing uh, at the right intersection. So I think that's a very different thing, and it requires a different set of tools to try to take it on. Yeah. Can you explain this thing with Amazon, too, about people going out and finding some kind of product that has a high overhead and then trying to convert it. And how often does this happen in other kind of instances? Yeah, I mean, in, in some sense, Amazon has unleashed this entire different ecosystem of business models that didn't exist before. And sorry, sorry for using a, a horrifying business terminology there. <laughs> but 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 there's an entire sector of businesses that consist of going on Amazon, finding something where the margin looks a little bit too high, uh, recruiting someone to create a knockoff design, taking that knockoff design to Alibaba.com or some other vendor to find a factory to produce it, and then selling it through fulfillment by Amazon. And you can demonstrate this to yourself uh, in, in one minute. Just go to Amazon and look up. So I'm on a, Amazon, I'm on a Microsoft Surface right now. Look up Microsoft Surface Power Supply on Amazon, and you might get 200 different competing products, and they'll range in price from $12 to $150 for nominally the same thing. And this is happening like all over Amazon that, that if there's that anybody that's got a brand name, you can come up with a cheaper version. And as long as you can engineer uh, a pretty good rating on Amazon, you might have a business. And so you could see a version of this from about 15 years ago. There's a uh, television brand in the U.S. called Vizio. Uh, and uh, when I was your age, uh, people would buy Sony televisions and they'd cost thousands of dollars. And, you know, the big brand names were Sony and then Samsung. Well, Vizio in 2007 beat both of them by creating uh, flat screen televisions that were almost as good and a lot cheaper. And they nearly drove Sony out of the television business because uh, Vizio had 200 employees in Irvine, California, and, and then this dispersed supply chain. They were manufactured by a vendor in China and distributed through Costco and, and on Amazon. And so they got the biggest market share in the U.S. with almost no employees. And so with a business model like that, the kind of companies that own skyscrapers in Tokyo or New York and have corporate jets and a lot of overhead... Um, they really can't compete against these uh, so, sort of uh, disruptor businesses that are not quite as good, but a lot cheaper. Uh, and now the cover charge for being a disruptor is pretty low. Like you can do it now. You, Chris Jeffries, if you have a business idea right now, you can 
go to Upwork and hire some contractors in Romania to do sort of some of the heavy lifting for you and go to Alibaba to find a vendor to manufacture it and fulfillment by Amazon to get it into people's homes. So if you got a credit card and a web connection, yeah, you can be a mogul uh, <laughs> briefly because it won't last long and everybody else is doing the same thing. That's why there's 200 different Microsoft Surface Powers bricks for sale on Amazon right, right now. Right. Anybody can do this business model. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I think they are, and I've seen that across the board with pretty much every gadget and gizmo and and thing that uh, that you can come up with. Now, is that good by the by the rules of the free market? Is that that's what we want? We want people to come in and and compete with these bigger giants who have who have essentially have a monopoly and they can charge what they want. Is this actually helping? Uh, and why don't these big corporations innovate? Do Do you think they still innovate? Or do they rest on their laurels and just kind of charge as much as they possibly can charge? Yeah. So two different flavors of questions. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's it's good. They're, they're, they're both good questions. So, so the first one, um, is this good? Well, I'm a social scientist, so I don't make judgments about good or bad. But I would say if you want a stable job that lasts for a while, this is a complete disaster. Uh, that, that this is... The idea of that level of tumult out there in the market is pretty tricky. People used to be, you know, I I, uh, I live in Detroit, and uh, Detroit is sort of the creator of the middle class in America. I'm just going to state that outright. <laughs> Detroit made the middle class by having giant companies like Ford and General Motors and Chrysler that could provide long-term employment, uh, good benefits like healthcare and retirement benefits. They really created the middle class by creating these large islands of stability that would allow people to have a legible economic life. They could see what their future is. They know what a pathway is. That is not the case anymore. If no business lasts for more than six months, um, that is not great for planning. That is not great for trying to take out a 30-year mortgage if you don't know how long your, your, uh, your company is going to last. So you may be old enough to remember the... Uh, the flip camera. Oh yeah, so this is yeah. Flip camera was everywhere. It had the largest market share in the portable video camera. So flip was, I think, invented around two thousand six. Yeah, uh, became pervasive. They also only had a hundred employees in San Francisco because they didn't manufacture it, and I'm not sure they even designed it. They were very good at at uh, at selling, you know, portable video camera, lightweight. Plugging and it plugs into your computer so you could easily up the, upload the videos. And so Flip went from non existent to largest share in its market. It got bought by Cisco, and two years later, it was closed down because everybody could do the same thing on their uh, smartphone. And so, oh, right, right. So they were almost like, you know, it took Eastman Kodak 120 years to go from pervasive to obsolete, and it only took Flip about four or five years. So, <laughs> It was very hard to imagine building a career uh, among businesses that look like that, that are so short-lived, that, that sort of uh, light up and then flame out later. Yeah. And do you think so, that I mean, that's great for innovation if you want nothing, if you want a world of fruit flies rather than sort of sequoia trees, you know, right. this, is, <laughs> this is great, but it's, but it's definitely a different world. It's not the one that we, uh, that we were used to. Yeah. Yeah. And the rate of technology is, is exponentially getting Faster and faster, right? Yeah, I remember when Google used to seem like an undefeatable monopoly, and then suddenly uh, OpenAI rolled out ChatGPT yeah. 3.5, and uh, overnight Google seemed like, oh, should I should I be shorting this thing? And which <laughs> which is kind of wild. I mean that so that level of instability is uh, you know full of innovation and excitement and terror and makes it really hard to plan for the future. Um, I told my kids uh, when they went to college, you can study whatever you want, but if you don't learn to code, you will die penniless, homeless, and alone. Um, so my son studied uh, history and political science, and my daughter studied opera performance and uh, uh, theatrical production management and history and psychology. Neither of them ever took a coding class. Now, in retrospect, I look like an idiot because coding is being supplanted by AI, which is much better at writing code than they ever would have been. And so, you know, maybe they were right. Maybe maybe uh, <laughs> skipping the coding part was actually a good choice. <laughs> 
We nobody. I don't think anybody could predict which jobs will be obsolete. But I would guess pretty much all of them at some point if we keep on with the technology that we've got, right? That's right. When we when we have the Chris Jeffries AI uh, chatbot, where where you're replaced by an avatar. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to my show. Welcome to my show. Uh, I hope not. I hope that we either retain some level of human, you know, and, and that's to some degree. I'm very weary of all technology for that for stripping us away from some of our purpose that we need. But at the same time, to live in this utopia where food is farmed by robots that. You know, have artificial intelligence that can pick out the bugs and all this stuff. Maybe life will be better. Maybe it'll be just about the same. Who knows? But I do know we need purpose to some degree, right? Um, so, how do you see national institutions shaping corporate structures and contributing to income inequality? Is I love this question. <laughs> I think that, it's, that, it sounds important. That, that is an inspired question. So, sadly, um, do we get to share the video or is this just going to be? Oh, audio? we're we're doing video. So you can. All right. So let me show you this, uh, this uh, shocking diagram here. So um, I came upon this, this sort of startling finding that you kind of think that the sources of inequality in the economy come from giant corporations that the CEO makes a ton of money and the people at the bottom make very little money. And there's, you know, the, there's nothing that seems more productive of inequality than giant corporations. And, and I discovered this surprising anomaly, which is that the countries that hope that were home to the biggest corporations were the ones with the lowest inequality and vice versa. Hmm. So so, so countries that have uh, very low income inequality, like Denmark or Sweden or Netherlands or Switzerland, they tend to have giant local corporations. And the countries that have nothing but tiny businesses, uh, like, like Colombia or Indonesia, tend to have very high inequality. And so it's kind of paradoxical. And this is a fun uh, diagram that I put together for this column that I write for I by IMD. Um, and I, I, this comes from a paper I did with a co-author, Asim Sinha, where we looked at what were the five biggest corporate employers in each of these eight different economies, Brazil, China, Denmark, Germany, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, and the US. And I, I swear you could look at this picture for hours uh, and find things to mystify you. One thing to know, Denmark's biggest company has more employees than China's biggest company. What? How? <laughs> Denmark has like five and a half million people and uh, China, many more. Three, and, three billion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some large number. Let's say 1.2 billion ish. <laughs> but, but, but that's like, that's, that is madness. Well, ISS, it's, they're obviously not all working in Denmark. They work around the world, but Denmark is really the home to some pretty substantial global companies. Um, China, a bit less so, surprisingly enough. Um, and in fact, if you look at what the industries uh, are around the world, uh, Germany's biggest employers are mostly in manufacturing. And India's biggest companies are mostly in IT services. In the US, it's overwhelmingly retailers. Oof. It's like, well, that's weird. The sizes don't match the size of the country. The industries are all different. You'd think big country, big companies, but that's not really what's going on. So this to me felt like a bit of a mystery. Like, how in the world did something like this happen? Why, you know, why, why can't, why aren't there any big companies in in uh, Colombia and you know, hardly in Brazil or Indonesia? These are giant com giant countries, but they can't seem to grow a, a big company. So super fascinating to me. Um, and the the story that we ended up coming up with uh, was using this idea of institutional terroir. And I know that's obnoxious, but terroir is usually used to describe, you know, wine regions in France. And it's about sort of the minerals in the soil and the weather and, and the temperature <laughs> and climate. So it's sort of describing what's what's the environment like um, for sort of growing, uh, you know, growing fruits and vegetables and animals. So the institutional terroir is that same idea, but looking at what are the national institutions and what kind of companies does it grow and how big do they get? Uh, 
And so Denmark's really good at growing multinational, uh, you know, amazingly successful companies. Uh, and Colombia, you know, not so much. There's something about the arrangement of national institutions that makes them more or less successful at growing particular kinds of companies. Manufacturing in Germany, uh, IT services in India, retail in the U.S., and that was sort of the core insight is there's something about the configuration of national institutions that makes some kinds of companies grow and others uh, wither and die. Uh, and so that's also associated with the level of income inequality. Um, the U.S. used to be great at growing very large manufacturers like GE and GM uh, and companies like AT&T. Now we really grow something different. There's been a sort of institutional climate change that makes us better at different flavors of business. So it's a bit of a psychedelic metaphor. Um, this is one where it's probably worth reading the book <laughs> just, yeah, to, yeah. just to unpack that. But that's that's the basic idea is that, you know, in the same way that if you asked, um, what are the five biggest mammal species in Canada and Mexico uh, and Nigeria and Indonesia, you know, they'd be very different. And right. you'd say it's something about, so, something about the climate uh, and, and the weather and the other species that accounts for that. That's kind of my story about inequality. Um, <laughs> little psychedelic for you. No, I was still, I can dig it because I've, Hey man, I've been there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, but yeah, what, what, what are some things that you really think could account for this? I mean, uh, and you're saying inequality in some of these countries that in, there's institutional intervention or something that they, the corporations don't grow as big and therefore the inequality becomes prevalent. Yeah, no, this is the right question to answer. So, I'm, so, you know, being here in Detroit, uh, we think about drivetrains as a great metaphor. And so in this case, uh, the, the flavor of national institutions shapes the kind of companies you have. The kinds of companies, that's really where income comes from. Most people get their income from working at a job in a company. And the kind of jobs that companies create depends on the structure of those companies, which in turn depends on the institutional terroir. So, so, but what national what, institutions leads to kinds of companies leads to how they pay people, and that's what inequality is all about. And then, but at the beginning of that is like a, a cultural kind of um, values or something that makes the policies that creates the institutions that then either intervene or don't intervene in private affairs, right? Yeah, so that's basically where does the climate come from? Like, where is right. why is there a lot of rain in in uh, Java and less rain in the Sahara? Um, and so, culture is definitely one thing you could point to. I would also say that uh, technology and technological changes ends up having a really big impact on what those pillars are. Like, the U.S. was the home of long term employment in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. And now it's the home of the gig economy. Yeah. <laughs> so technology and, and sort of legal changes can really alter that that sort of the, the menu of items available to create a company. Yeah. Do you and can you speak at all? I know I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse, but as far as what caused that and what, and is it is it really good? Are we going to be able to do something great with that kind of gig economy, or are we being totally screwed? It really depends on which country you're talking about. <laughs> so, so I'll make an observation. So you're in Germany, and if you look at, you know, first of all, I don't think Uber still exists there. They probably no. pronounce it different. It'd be like Uber. Uber. But, no, no, yeah. they they were big on the taxi unions. They they wanted to keep the the taxi services they had. Yeah. Yeah, like the Uber business model doesn't work in in Germany. It doesn't work the same way in Sweden, uh, you know, or India or Nigeria or Indonesia. But, you know, these uh, um, the, the basic technology gets enacted differently depending on that institutional terroir. The kind of businesses that are possible depends on the existing set of institutions. What's legal to do? So, gig. Uh, and similarly, sort of the impact of something like the gig economy depends a lot on what those other institutions look like. So I'm going to give the idealized version of Denmark. 
Uh, we Americans on the left love Denmark and revere it as a, <laughs> as a model. Of, we say, I'm moving to Denmark, man. Screw this. I hate this place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah except it's so flat. I mean, that's it's the one thing. I just, it's cold. It's so yeah. cold. Cold and flat. Like there's no real natural beauty there. And uh, plus, I could never keep the name straight because it's like Lars Jensen, Jens Larsen. <laughs> anyway, but, but you know, other other than that, it's a fantastic, you know, wonderful place that I have no nothing. offense to our Danish viewers. We, you know, I'm sure it's wonderful in spring, but yeah. Yeah. And the queen smokes. Like, what is up with that? <laughs> but, but, but Denmark gets, you know, a bunch of things right. Um, yeah. And so, you know, in the US, if you work a gig economy job, let's say you work for Uber or you're a, you're a food delivery driver in the US, if you break your leg, you can't work, you lose your medical insurance. Uh, you live in your car and your kids get taken away. And then you end up getting a giant set of medical bills that you will never be able to pay off. Uh, Denmark, you break your leg, you get you have national health insurance, you stay home, and while recovering, you take some coding classes in Python and SQL. And then when you're recovered, you get a job as a coder. <laughs> so in, in some sense, you know, how you experience the gig economy. Um, in a precarious world with a bad social safety net, it's a nightmare because you you don't have certain basic human needs taken care of. You can't be assured that you're going to be able to cover your health care, take care of your kids, you know, live in the same house. Yeah. If you had a basic social safety net in place where everyone knows my health care, my housing, my access to sort of food and basics uh, is going to be taken care of, then the risks associated with precarious jobs ends up being much lower. And so you might be more willing to take a risk and try interesting new things because it's not an existential choice. Um, you know, in the US, losing your job is basically losing your identity and your health care. And it's it's really a disaster. Um, yeah. And there are places in the world, you know, civilized places where that is not the consequence, where where it's a setback. But you can, you know, you can find your way out of it. And yeah. so I think this speaks in favor in a world where jobs are very precarious, where the turnover is very high. Um, it can be either terrifying or exciting, depending on whether you're taken care of. If there's a safety net, why not try the gig economy? You know, why not, uh, you know, shift jobs and, and uh, you know, take some risks because the basics are taken care of. Right. Right. And if uh, you always, when we talk about the gig economy, it, it sounds like it's insinuated that there is a lack of benefits because you're not a full time employee. But at the same time, a gig economy, you think, could probably equal more freedom in some cases. Yeah. In placed in the right terroir, you know, placed, placed. <laughs> Jerry, I, you I, keep I, those fancy French words off my show. <laughs> sorry. I know I'm, I'm, I'm pushing the terroir <laughs> button hard, but I, but I, uh, uh, but but it kind of works. I mean, it's actually pretty good. So yeah. you know what what you know <laughs> in Michigan when you walk out of the house in January, you got to wear a warm coat. You know, you're you're kind of aware of that ambient situation. So you're, um, in some sense, it could be great and exciting to have a more you know more varied economy if the basics are taken care of. And I guess the sort of the follow on point would be that in a in a world where jobs where sort of the nature of employment is precarious and unpredictable and changes regularly, it's really essential that we have a basic national safety net. Um, yeah. In the absence of some basic social safety net, you're condemning large parts of the population to a precarious and kind of terrifying existence. So it might have made sense to have company provided health insurance and pensions in 1960, where most people were planning on, or many people were planning on staying at the same job for life. It makes no sense now. Yeah. Yeah. That right. was my, uh, that was my editorializing there, by the way. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Really good. Yeah. Um, so how do you, how do you, what role do you think management research can play in achieving sustainable development goals? What, what, what? Yeah, so I, I do have a bit of a social agenda here. I'm a big fan of, at least in, in some level, about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So they they uh, declared a program in September 2015 saying, by 2030, here are 17 goals that we want to achieve. And they're big goals like no poverty, no hunger, equal access to health care, 
uh, clean environment, sustainable cities. Like they're pretty, pretty gigantic goals. But there is a real role for business in all of these. And you know, the, the UN and the, the framers of these goals were very clear that we're not getting there just based on government action. We need business to take on a role in helping achieve these sustainable development goals. I mean, so much the essential economic activity of our world depends on corporate decision making. And so the hope would be that business research of the sort that my colleagues and I do that it could really provide blueprints uh, and methods for businesses to help achieve these goals. And let's just take sort of decarbonization as the single biggest existential issue uh, in the world. If business doesn't do it, we're screwed. You know, in, in, if business does not take on decarbonization, uh, you know, full throttle, uh, we're pretty much doomed as a species. And so, what is it that researchers can do to help businesses take this on? I mean, we know how organizations change. We know how organizations make the decisions that they make. Um, my my uh, hope and belief is that researchers can help guide that pathway by helping decision makers and companies figure out, you know, what's our path to decarbonization? How do we make sensible choices for the long term? Um, and also that we can train our students to be you know, change makers or architects for the future is that when they come to, to get degrees with us, we can train them in the methods of decarbonization and being effective at, at leading their companies to, to take that on. Yeah. So just focusing on that one, I think it you know, generalizes to the other uh, sustainable development goals, but, but decarbonization, as they say at, uh, at Ford, is job one. <laughs> Yeah, well, I hope so. I mean, and how likely with capitalism's track record do you think that we'll be able to do that with minimal institutional intervention? How about them Lakers? <laughs> in, in, in my household, how about them Lakers is the all-purpose conversational off-ramp. It's the segue to something different. So... <laughs> I mean, who can say? Capitalism is full of surprises. Right, right, right. Well, I, I'm always on here with a weary eye about corporate malfeasance, profit. I'll motive. put that one off to Corey Doctorow. He can, yeah, he can figure yeah, out yeah. the answer. I'm Hopefully. sure it's a pretty easy couple of switches we can turn. Yeah. He's like, I'm so tired of talking about it. Just, yeah. Um, and you had some proposed remedies in here, which was a great slide you had in one of your last talks is break them up, ban acquisitions with firms of. Uh, less than a hundred billion dollar market cap, all these different things. Was anything out there really st stuck with you in that list? Yeah, I mean, some of them I think are actually terrible. So, so the uh, the, the slide that I shared had about twenty different programs that have been proposed out there, uh, and one of them was you know Josh Hawley. Uh, companies yeah. over a hundred billion dollars are banned from making any acquisitions, and I kind of think. You know, with all due respect to Senator Hawley, I think that's moronic. Um, okay, See, I don't want to give any right, respect to just right, Hawley, right. <laughs> This is like a ruthless Republican dude, right? Word, yeah, he's kind of a uh, you know, and he has a new book about manhood, which is just great. <laughs> So self, <laughs> self follow me on Twitter. You'll see what I think of that one. It's really yeah. a little, little bit comical for him to giving advice on manliness, but yeah. um, but uh, oh, oh, geez. What if the what if the next election goes wrong and I get arrested? You're going to save me, right? Yeah, right, right, totally. Give you me can asylum come, in Germany. Come to Germany. You can live in my 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 storage room. Yeah, Ex excellent. <laughs> so, um, but the proposal was just ban acquisitions for companies over 100 billion dollars. And you, you know, one thought is, well, do you mean 100 billion in revenues or market capitalization or assets? Like, you want to be a little bit more specific than that because a lot of companies go over 100 billion in in market cap briefly. Right. Um, but you know. Most tech companies are founded with the intention to sell out to bigger companies later. Like that's the whole reason why people create their innovative new little startups is the hope that uh, Facebook or Google or or uh, uh, will will acquire them. And so if you say no more acquisitions by big companies, um, you could imagine an entire sector of innovative startups saying, "Oh." Okay, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a fairly ham-fisted way to approach the problem. I mean, if what you if what you're after is innovation, then taking out the the end stage, taking out the the exit strategy for innovators seems like a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, people wouldn't start a biotech company 
if there was no chance that they could then sell it to Pfizer or Merck down the road. Because sure. Pfizer and Merck, they've got a big sales force. They're great at getting things through the FDA. I mean, they're yeah. really good at, at, at things that big companies can do. And biotech's really good at the the early stage innovation. And well, so it, they got the regulators uh, locked in and it's a system that works by itself. But at the same time, you would get s you, like flip camera, for instance, would never be able to scale up in this environment because of the vendor and the like, um, what do you, what do you call it? The um, vertical integration of these companies are so overwhelming. They're locked in. And so could these people even scale up if they had a chance, if you did cap the big boys? No, I think, think, I think that's exactly right. Like, what would it take for a scrappy startup search engine company to replicate the, the sort of archipelago of server farms that Google has out there or, or that Amazon has? It would be insane and it would be redundant. And why, why do we want these power-hungry server farms going up in, you know, in every sad town uh, I mean, we already got Google. I mean, if, yeah. uh, if you've already got sort of Pfizer in place with its distribution channels and its ability to get through the FDA, it might make sense to completely replicate that whole apparatus so that a company that's invented, you know, an alternative to aspirin or whatever. Yeah. Can, <laughs> but, but, um, but uh, anyway, I, I kind of disagree with my some of my anti-monopoly buddies on this issue about just how sensible is it to replicate. Yeah. The same thing that already exists in other forms, um, but the I think that the the solution that I found most appealing was to create a new regulatory agency because antitrust is slow and unpredictable, and it's if I put it in the book, it's it can be like trying to do surgery with oven mitts on because it's just not necessarily the right tools for the job. <laughs> um, but regulatory agencies, assuming that. We don't end up with a completely new Congress that decides that the Constitution forbids the administrative states and any kind of regulatory agencies, which are some folks that believe that out there. Yep. It, um, you, you could, you know, the equivalent of the FDA, FCC, FAA, but regulating tech, you need it to be sort of well paid, well staffed. Uh, with no revolving door so that the people that staff it can't then go off to work for Google and Amazon and Facebook and uh, and Microsoft uh, after they've learned you know how the inner workings of the agency like you really want it to be a career for people that are tech savvy uh, you know well run well paid thoughtful and and, and empowered to sort of uh, keep the guardrails up uh, in the world of technology so I like new regulatory agency as the most sort of nimble and thoughtful choice. Yeah. As somebody who's like leans on radical revolutionary anarchism and all this other stuff that's really appealing to young people. At the same time, if you regulate capitalism, reinvigorate the regulators, I'll I'll listen. I'll I'll still be on board with some aspects of you know, the free market, but uh you gotta show me that you care about the environment and you gotta show me that you care about workers' rights and stuff. And uh I'll drink the Kool-Aid then, you know. Mm, word. <laughs> Um, so we ran out of time. We didn't even get all, all of our questions, but you should come back and we should do it again. What do you say? I, I'm in. Yeah. I'm working on the next, uh, the next adventure, which is uh, creating the green economy in Detroit using worker owned enterprises at a grassroots level. So cool. take it in a very different direction. <laughs> I like this because you're reinvigorating the Rust Belt because uh, this is a beautiful, lots of infrastructure still there. Um yeah. yeah, very true. And there's also a ton of open space. So if you wanted to do district geothermal, I mean, things that in Germany is probably every street corner has probably got a, a community solar microgrid and we're still, you know, <laughs> trying to accomplish almost, some of the basics. Almost, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and vegetarian restaurants, of course, with like I, uh, vegan Blutwurst. And <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, uh, I'm impressed. And I don't think I'd ever go back to the United States uh, expecting that it would be more advanced or more, you know, less primitive. They, these these Germans, they know what they're doing. And there's aspects of the uh, it that don't work still. It's a little funny, very capitalistic in some ways. But at the same time, man, they're industrious. Oh, wh where are you located? So I'm in central Germany, but I used to live in, in Darmstadt, which is where Merck is headquartered. Uh, you know, they were, you know, 
formulated MDMA in 1912 or something. And uh, it's a big pharmaceutical town. Everything runs through them. And there's all these little laboratories that get business from them because they subcontract out some of their work. So it's a big science town. Oh. And uh, it was fascinating. And this idea that uh, Germans say, come and come you spare it. You know, like Tom Waits says, it's true. They show up on time all the time <laughs> without fail. And um, everybody in Germany, I heard the, the statistics say, um, it's like the most, from people 18 to 35, the highest employment rate. So these people want to work and they're sort of proud of um, what they do. But I think it has a lot to do with these workers' rights. You know, same in Scandinavia with the, uh, the you know, eight hour, seven hour work day or something like this. They work th three days a week. I don't know, but they, <laughs> it's awesome. But um, yeah, it seems to work for these people really well. And they subsidize food and, and housing to where that never gets out of control. Huh, that's amazing. Okay, can I ask you this question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, have, I have been told that if you try jaywalking in Germany, one of the grownups will say, don't do that, the children are watching. The belief that if you jaywalk, that, that, uh, that children will say, wait, the rules don't always apply? And so that it's supposed to be some actual like common German phrase. Oh no, the children are watching. It could be. I don't know. I never heard that because I don't. <laughs> I don't have kids. I never hang out. I don't go hang out with kids. But that could be true because you have to be Try careful. jaywalking and see if somebody see says what, that to you. Uh, or they the, just shoot you. <laughs> yeah, they're going to get the guillotine out and take you know. Oh, that's France. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I no. can't tell the difference between those two. They're yeah, basically yeah. interchangeable. I had a Dutch and, and Danish. That's a big one for Americans. to. When I came, I didn't know the difference. Uh, yeah, yeah. And actually, there's a surprising homology between the architecture because between because Christian IV, when he was the uh, king of Denmark, he wanted to turn Copenhagen into the Amsterdam, but of like of the, the, the Baltics. And so he imitated, like you could see architecture from the 1600s looks like a knockoff of of Dutch architecture from the 1600s. It's the weirdest <laughs> damn thing. Cool. I mean, yeah. this was this the heyday of a Danish culture there, the 16th century, whatever it was. I I don't know if there's ever been a heyday. I mean, it's hard to point to. They had know, some great... painters, like during some before the Renaissance. They had like some painters that were good. And okay, but in but but the Dutch like ruled like during the you know the the seven so during the 1600s, the Dutch Golden Age. Like that's Rembrandt and Vermeer. And oh, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the Danish had nothing to show for themselves. Right. It's basically flat and cold. I mean, it's also flat and so not quite as cold in in the nether world, but um, but they did manage to come up with some great art because they were rich. Like they were, they really were at this choke point uh, and living, very commercially oriented. Living on, say, break free the Spanish. <laughs> yeah, living on the living on the port, and also the first that invented the stock market, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and they kind of really w went hard with Protestantism and saying, yeah, asceticism is for losers, making a ton of money. That's gold. <laughs> it's gold, Jerry. Yeah, we have that now in America. We call it the pro prosperity gospel, right? It's these, That's uh, right. <laughs> don't bring that back, please don't. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, Professor Jerry Davis, we're going to talk after this. Uh, he's a professor of business administration, University of Michigan, wonderful human being. Uh, Taming Corporate Power in the 21st Century is the book. And he's a wonderful human being, and he's a big fan of Black Mirror. Word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll sign off to everybody. Bye, everybody. See you next time.